Uh, well, I would like to, to welcome you, everyone, to this um, online training session on, on, the, uh, on the standard operating procedures for handling and, um, yeah, I hope you can see it in full mode now. Yeah, this online training session will be on, um, sorry, I have some problems here. Sorry, yeah, just a second. Yeah. I hope now it's visible. Can you confirm? Yeah, okay. So uh, welcome everyone. Uh, this training session will be on um, handling and preparation of soil samples for chemical and physical analysis. So basically sample pretreatment. Uh, for, um, for those who don't know me, I'm Filippo Benedetti and I'm working at the Global Soil Partnership uh, when I'm supporting the activities of Golotolan, that is the Global Soil Laboratory Network. It was established in 2017 under the FAO, so the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations. Um, I will just give a, a, a brief introduction to the network before we start the, the, the training session. So basically, Glossolan was established in 2017 uh, because um, there was a need to harmonize standards and protocols among laboratories and uh, to build the capacity of laboratories to improve their capacities in um, analyzing soil samples. Um, for this reason, uh, the network was established and we focus mainly on different areas of work. Uh, one of these areas of work is quality assurance and quality control. Uh, so Glossolan is supporting laboratories in performing internal and external quality control practices. And we are also supporting labs in um, organizing uh, proficiency testing. So Glossolan is organizing APT, also called ring test or interlaboratory comparison that will be um, implemented also in 2021, 2022. Um, then, we are working to harmonize standard operating procedures, SOPs, uh, and we will be giving training to, to facilitate the implementation of these SOPs. And also these trainings are on other topics like health and safety, uh, equipment, and many other topics. For instance, today's training is about this. So today we will um, present the SOP, the standard operating procedures, for uh, handling and preparation of soil sample. That was an SOP that, one, that is an SOP that was uh, harmonized and published by Glossolan two years ago. And today, this training aims to uh, facilitate the implementation of this SOP in order to allow whole labs to perform uh, sample preparation in the same way. Because this, of course, is a basic step before uh, the analysis occur. And regarding equipment, we are also working on that by giving training on equipment the purchasing, use and maintenance, and establishing and donation and bartering system. And we're also working on soil spectroscopy. So we're trying to build the capacity of soil laboratories worldwide regarding soil spectroscopy by giving training, producing documents and organizing meetings and workshops. Uh, Grosan is also working since last year on um, the harmonization of uh, procedures to assess the quality of fertilizers and a sub-network sub was established. This is called INFA. This is the International Network on Fertilizer Analysis. Uh, the network grew a lot in the, in, the, um, in the last years since its establishment. And as you can see, uh, all the green countries are those registering in the network. So the network really increased a lot. And we have almost 800 soil laboratories registered from 151 countries. So we're really happy about this, uh, this, uh, the size of the network and we hope to uh, increase even more. Uh, the network is structured in uh, regional and national soil laboratory networks in order to better downscale the activities of the network. And as you can see from the bottom, in the bottom right corner of your, of your screen, um, these uh, regions have been established, these regional networks have been established and now have different, uh, like also them, they have uh, quite a good and high number of labs uh, registered in them. So we have SealNet for the Regional Soil Laboratory Network for Asia, NinaLab for Near East and North Africa, AfriLab, that is the Regional Soil Laboratory Network for African countries, Eurozolan grouping together labs operating in Europe and Eurasia. Then we have ASPAC for the Pacific, and Latsolan is the Regional Soil Laboratory Network for colleagues operating in uh, Latin America and in the Caribbean. 
Um, as I mentioned, Glossolan is working a lot on capacity development, and we are uh, organizing training sessions on different topics, such as wet chemistry, dry chemistry, and health and safety. Uh, there is a, this website, uh, this web page is, uh, if you go on Glossolan web page, you will find in the left menu, capacity development, and you will find all the information on the trainings there. For instance, before a webinar like this of today with the take place, uh, you will find all information about the event and the link to register. Why after the implementation of the webinar, you will find all the uh, material such as the presentation and the video recordings. So this means that you will be able to go through this training once again after today's session. So if you want to watch it again, or if you miss a part of it, or you want to share with a colleague, Please, uh, if you consult the website in a couple of days, we should be able to upload all the materials there very soon. Um, as you can see, we implement many different sessions. On the right, you see all the sessions for soil spectroscopy, while on the left side of the screen, in this table, I reported all the trainings that uh, were organized on wet chemistry and health and safety as well. And these have been implemented in different languages. You see, we have English, but also Spanish, Arabic, and French. For instance, today's webinar will be implemented in English, but the same topic, so the same webinar of today, will be implemented in uh, French tomorrow. This means that if we have uh, French colleagues today, you are uh, invited to join tomorrow's sessions. Uh, let me try to say it in French as well. Uh, donc, s'il y a des, des collègues in, de, de, de les pays francophones, euh, s'il vous plaît, euh, attendez les, les webinaires euh, demain aussi. Il sera présent en France, en français. So, gay, I hope I pronounce it well. Otherwise, you can reiterate this message. No, no, it's very nice. Uh, okay. So this today the, the webinar will be in English, but tomorrow this will be done in, in French as well. And as you can see, we have other two sessions that will be implemented in the coming weeks. So next week there will be a webinar on soil electrical conductivity measurement, um, and this will be done in English. While a session on internal quality control will be done in French on 15 of December, and we'll try to implement the same session on internal quality control than in January in English as well. So please uh, consult, like visit the web page so you can register to all these webinars because these are very good opportunities to uh, share your knowledge with colleagues um, and make questions, raise questions to other laboratories, other experts, and really a good opportunity to share the knowledge and improve our uh, and your analytical capacity. Today's uh, training session, as I mentioned, will be on um, the SOP the standard operating procedures for handling and preparation of soil samples for chemical and physical analysis. This document is available on the Glosson website. You can download it for free, as all our documents uh, is already um, translated in English, Spanish, and Russian. And we will work to make it available also in French and Arabic and Chinese and so all UN official language. If you want to translate it in your local national language, you can do it. Just contact us and we can work on that. Um, today's session, uh, as I mentioned, this webinar will be implemented in two different days. Today's in English and tomorrow in French. So the lecturers for today are uh, Mrs. Lesego Muketsi Selepe from Botswana and Mr. Joseph Uponi from um, Nigeria. Um, um, let me um, briefly tell you that Lesego is also serving as current chair for the African Soil Laboratory Network, while uh, Mr. Uponi was the former chair of the um, African Soil Laboratory Network, so AFILAB. While tomorrow's sessions will be um, given by uh, Mr. Sheikh uh, Suge, Suge Sheikh, sorry, uh, that is the current vice chair for the French speaking countries in AFILAB and together with Mr. Mustafa uh, Abdulaman, that is the former vice chair for the French speaking countries in AFILAB and currently serving as um, um, Glossolan vice chair. Uh, so without any further ado, uh, thank you a lot for your um, participation to today's session. Uh, now we will go, we'll, I will give the floor to the trainers of today. So Josef and Lesego, who will present 
uh, the, the, this important training, because again, this seems, may seem very basic, but I think it's very important session because uh, I think before uh, performing the analysis, we have to be sure and make sure that the sample is, is correctly prepared uh, once entered the lab. After the presentation, we will have time um, to, you will have time to raise questions directly to the trainers. So you can even start uh, writing your question in the chat or, or you can take the floor afterwards. We will have time to read all your questions. You can take the floor and share every, every question to the trainers. So just feel free to, to save your questions for later. Uh, I really want to thank Yosef and Lesego for your kind availability, as well uh, as Suge and Mustafa, who will lead the French training tomorrow. Uh, I think this is very nice that, uh, I mean, you give uh, your time and availability to share your knowledge with other peers, other colleagues from all over the world. Today we have colleagues from Europe to Pacific region, from Asia to Africa. So I think it's, um, it's a very nice uh, opportunity to share knowledge of these procedures uh, adopted in different parts of the world. And uh, so thanks a lot for your availability. And uh, once again, so please enjoy uh, this training. Tomorrow we will have the same training in French. And now I will give the floor to, I think, Josef, you will present for the English session. Um, so I think you should be able to share your screen, Josef? Or yes, uh, okay. I will just share my screen. Thank you very much, Filippo. Uh, once again, welcome to all the participants. I consider it a, a great privilege to be able to share with one another at a time like this. And um, uh, this presentation, uh, we want to give credit to uh, Suge for making the PowerPoints uh, available. But this, like Filippo has said, the SOP for the sample preparation is already uh, available on the FAO website. This is just to give some voice to it as we make the presentation. I'd like to also acknowledge my co-presenter uh, and my chairperson uh, who has given me the go ahead to make the presentation on our behalf. Uh, Madam Lesego. So I will share my screen now and uh, we'll start the presentation. Oh, screen. Okay. Oh, where is it now? Sorry. Uh, sorry, just a moment to share the screen. Yeah. Okay. Hana, Hana said it. Okay. Share screen. Uh. That's my presentation. Okay, here we go. Can we see the screen now? Yes, yes. Okay. Yes. Can you put uh, in full? Uh, full okay. Uh, so uh, this presentation is on uh, handling and preparation of soil samples for chemical and physical analysis. And Sorry, can you put like in presentation mode so it's a little bit bigger? Okay. Thanks, okay. yeah. Thanks a lot. Okay. Uh, like I said, the presentation has been prepared by Sugeshik, but all of us are, have contributed and some other people have contributed from other places also. Right from the beginning, I want to emphasize the importance of uh, sample preparation and sample handling. Uh, if your samples are not well prepared, no matter how accurate your instruments are, no matter how uh, well-trained your personnel are, 
you will already be getting false results. And that's why this is so fundamental to the quality of soil and plant analysis. So though it's so, fun, it's so basic, yet it is the foundation on which the quality of any result we are going to get is based. So I expect that we take this very seriously. The overall aim of the SOP is to provide guidance on the handling and preparation of samples prior to chemical and physical analysis, while ensuring that the samples are prepared in a reproducible and standardized manner. Uh, there are minor variations from place to place, but thanks to uh, Glossoland that is helping us to harmonize so that we are sure we are all using the same uh, procedures. Now, it's, uh, there are rules that need to be played by different participants in the lab. The lab manager takes overall supervision and he has to make sure that uh, the different SOPs for handling the soil samples are available and the people who are handling those analysis are adequately qualified and trained to use them. They should have been tested to be sure they are able to do it reproducibly. So that aspect of supervision is the responsibility of the lab manager. We should also ensure that safe uh, handling and disposal of samples uh, by staff is done. This is because uh, soil samples by nature uh, carry different other things apart from the soil. They have pathogens and things like that. And sometimes some samples are special. They may be radiated samples. So the, the lab manager should have prior knowledge of all such information so that the staff who are handling the samples are adequately prepared to handle them. He should also take responsibility to ensure that import or export restrictions on samples are taken into account. For samples, for laboratories that receive samples from uh, different other countries, this is very, very important so that we're not transferring pathogens from one country to another. Whoever the lab member is who is responsible for actually carrying the sample uh, preparation, it is very, very important that it should be adequately trained and it should be able to plan and organize all operations in accordance to the procedure without taking uh, shortcuts or modifying things that have not been authorized. Now, to be able to do the soil uh, sample uh, preparations, we need several apparatus. Uh, as simple as it is, there are basic things that we need equipment, and, but all such equipment must be so that they minimize uh, contamination. We know that soil analysis uh, comes in various forms. There's physical analysis, there's uh, microbial analysis, there is chemical analysis. Depending on the type of analysis that you want to do, it will influence the way the sample is going to be prepared. But one basic rule is that you must avoid uh, cross-contamination while you are trying to prepare the sample for analysis. And also, uh, oftentimes, because the samples come from different fields, proper records must be kept and uh, in such a way as to be able to uh, trace the samples as they go uh, along the process of analysis in the lab all due safety procedures also must be observed. In the picture here, uh, where I'm moving my mouse, we see it, an example of a drying facility with uh, metal racks and shelves in a well aerated place. Uh, that is a requirement, a good requirement uh, for a good uh, provision for soil uh, drying, for instance. But take note, the issue of making sure that samples are not contaminated is very, very important. So give enough space between the samples. Uh, oftentimes we may need some grinders in order to be able to crush uh, the samples, uh, especially some of the harder samples. Clay samples, for instance, are very hard when they are dry. So you need to be able to crush them. The idea here is not to grind them to find powder as such, but just to loosen them to their uh, loose particles that enable us to be able to sieve them for analysis. I must point out at this instance that sometimes we need uh, cold storage for not all samples need to be dried. For instance, if you are doing sample analysis for uh, mineral nitrogen, nitrate and ammonium, then the samples have to be stored fresh from the field uh, and then weighed fresh like that for analysis. So to be able to do that, you need some fridge freezer facilities to be able to uh, store the samples appropriately. Uh, health and safety matters are very important make sure that you have done some proper risk assessment before 
uh, the uh, job is assigned and uh, all the protocols written. In doing the risk assessment, you will consider the uh, sample handling and preparation facilities like the type I've described above already. Uh, you think of uh, what to do with the remaining samples that you're not going to use, how you are going to dispose of them without littering the place or causing further contamination in other areas. Uh, you think of uh, local regulations for disposal of uh, samples and laboratory waste. All those things have to be taken into proper consideration to be sure that you are working within the rules. Once samples have come to the lab, it's very important that the samples be properly registered. So samples receipt should be carried out by the primary laboratory contact who keeps a uh, uh, record uh, using appropriate sample registration forms. This may be in paper form or electronic format. Most labs are going paperless now. So you find them having some uh, laboratory management uh, uh, systems in, in installed that they can use for doing their sample registration. But one thing is common, whether you are using paper or you are using the electronic one, it is very important that some basic information be, cap be captured. For example, the uh, customer sample identification, because the customers may have their own special ID for the samples. You have to take note of that. But the laboratory also has its own unique lab number or identification for every sample that comes into the lab to avoid uh, uh, misplacement of samples and uh, crossing of results. And then you the, the registration information should also include whatever preparations and analytical processes that are required. Some clients we require, uh, we ask you to do some special preparations for them. You have to agree on those ones with your clients before the sample preparation is done. If they didn't give you any specific way to do it, then you follow the, uh, the, the, the procedure for the lab, but keep the client informed that that's exactly what you have done. That communication between the uh, lab and the client is very important to avoid uh, misunderstanding. Then the total number of samples and the type of subsamples that are needed is also important. You know that for the various analysis we do in the lab, uh, we do not use exactly the same kind of fraction for all the analysis. So you need to already take note of the number of uh, samples that are needed. Uh, for instance, while you are using 2mm fractions for exchangeable cations and uh, 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 exchangeable acidity, you need final fractions for organic carbon and total nitrogen. So those subsampling processes must have been documented for the people who are going to do the analysis for avoidance of uh, mistakes and doubts. There should also be proper sample description. As the soil is being registered for analysis, they should be described on an as received basis prior to sample preparation. Now, uh, if the samples are not in proper order or anything that you notice that is peculiar to the sample have to be properly documented uh, before the sample preparation. And I already mentioned that every sample must have its own unique identity. Each lab has their own way of uh, giving unique uh, lab IDs to their samples. Uh, this ensures traceability as the sample goes from one analyst to another. Oftentimes, you may not have one person doing all the analysis. So as the sample is going from one analyst to the other, there is the need for traceability. And good sample labeling and identification is very, very uh, important. Now, there are several uh, preparation procedures, uh, and we are going to go through those procedures now step by step. Once you have identified that the samples have good integrity, that is, they come in containers that are not leaking, and you know, uh, once they have good uh, integrity, then you, not, you cannot proceed to the drying of the sample. Uh, the drying area has to be well ventilated, like I already said before, but sometimes, uh, you may not have such type of space and you need to dry in the oven. If you need to dry in the oven, you must dry at a temperature of about 35 degrees plus or minus five degrees centigrade, not higher. Because uh, if you dry it at a higher temperature, you'll be causing some chemical changes in the soil. 
So it's very important to maintain that temperature. Preferably, we would like that the samples be air dried. Once the samples have been air dried, they will need to be disintegrated. Uh, to do that, you need to crush them on a clean surface. Uh, you can use uh, a wooden, a wooden uh, pin roller or with a pestle and mortar to crush them uh, gently. You are not really grinding these to find particles. You just want to loosen them very well so that you're able to see. You remember that our analysis is done on fine fractions. We want to remove, separate the soil, the active soil fractions from the gravels and pebbles. So when you crush in your mortar, uh, you, are, you then go through the process of sieving. For most soil analysis, we use 2 mm sieved samples. Uh, so you should have your sieve readily available, 2 mm sieve, and then also 0.5 mm sieve. The 0.5 mm sieve is used to get final fractions that are used for uh, uh, organic carbon analysis and for uh, total nitrogen analysis. Sometimes we need to do some very fine grinding if you are going into spectroscopy analysis. I'm not going to emphasize on that uh, much now, but for spectroscopy purposes, you need very fine grinding. Now, uh, you grind one sample at a time and you do thorough cleanup after each grinding to be sure that you don't have cross contamination from one sample to another. If you are preparing bulk samples, samples that are large that you are going to distribute to other labs, for instance, for analysis, you may need to be sure that the samples are properly homogenized before you begin to uh, uh, fraction the samples to other labs. To be able to do that uh, homogenization, you may need a drum uh, roller like this one in the picture here that I'm moving my mouse over. They are simply, they are very easy to design. You don't need to get a very sophisticated one. Uh, and then you roll them several times uh, for two, three hours to be sure that your sample is thoroughly mixed before you begin to divide into fractions. Now to divide them into fractions, uh, you can use any of two, uh, several methods. Uh, bulk materials can be divided by refill splitting. This is a refill sampler. It's readily available. Uh, it enables you to split the sample in two at different successions. Or you can use the coning and quartering system where you heap the soil together and then you, in the cone and divide into four places. And then you take uh, some fractions, mix again, and you keep uh, coning and quartering until you have the size of sample that you need. This is necessary so that uh, every subsample is actually well represent, a good representative of the main sample. Uh, you can see that the person who is doing the uh, refill sampling here has a, uh, is wearing gloves. That's important so that you don't uh, contaminate the samples. You know your hand contains salts, especially sodium salts. Uh, make sure that you wear the appropriate uh, uh, PPE to maximize uh, the integrity of the uh, samples. Now, once you have gotten the samples, it's important that they should be properly packaged and labeled. Now, labeling is very important. Once you miss the label of the sample, you are going to get wrong results and you are going to make wrong uh, 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 interpretations. Now, the type of label that you use should be such that it protects the sample from moisture, from pets, and from spillages. The use of barcode uh, labels or QR labels is encouraged. That's the direction we should all go to. Now, if you know you are going to make three or four subsamples, it means that you will have printed uh, triplicates or quadruplicates of those labels. So that as you are dividing the samples, you put the labels immediately for the avoidance of mixing up of samples. Uh, once those have been, uh, the samples have been properly packaged, storage is also important. Uh, materials should be kept in inert containers. Uh, you can use uh, uh, strong plastic uh, bags. You can use uh, bottles. You can use some other plastic uh, uh, containers also that are leak proof. And then store in uh, properly designated areas with good storage facilities uh, so that when you are looking for samples, you are able to locate them easily. 
it's very, very important that the, the place will be kept dry and free of pests and rodents so that they don't puncture your bags and they cause uh, further cross contaminations. Once your samples are ready like this for analysis, the rest uh, is actually a question of uh, how the analysts handle the samples when they begin analysis. But this process of preparing the samples for analysis is so crucial to avoid uh, mixing up of samples and cross contamination of samples. Uh, I've just included here a little flow chart of what the sample preparation procedure is all about. So you receive the samples from outside, you dry them if necessary, because I've said to us that for nitrate and ammonium, uh, mineral nitrogen analysis, you need the fresh samples. So you need to be sure whether you need to dry the samples or not. For those that need to be dried, it should be air dried or oven dried at the appropriate temperature. Uh, you disintegrate the samples as already mentioned and sieve through two mm sieve. And if you need to do further crushing to 0.5 mm, if you are doing nitrogen and the, uh, organic carbon, uh, make sure you do the subsampling properly. And then uh, uh, such subsampling is very crucial so that you don't uh, mix up samples. Grinding by hand or mechanically, uh, e.g. for total elemental analysis, organic carbon uh, is, is recommended. Then create proper records, an archival system, so that if samples are uh, required at other times, you can still go back and pick them. Uh, uh, once uh, analysis are done, it's important how your samples are handled for disposal. So please ensure that uh, you follow the regulations in your locality for proper sample disposal. But if they are meant to be archived or stored, then you send them to the appropriate archive. That's just a brief uh, rundown on soil sample preparations. Uh, we are ready to take some questions now. And the we will lead the uh, question and answer session so that, but uh, we are free to make some contributions also. Uh, thank you very much for the privilege of making this presentation. Good morning or good afternoon or evening, wherever, what part of the world you are in. Thanks, thanks a lot, Mr. Rufoni. Uh, I'm sorry again, but I, cannot, I probably miss me with my camera, so I cannot display myself. But uh, yeah, thanks a lot for the nice presentation. Um, I think it was very clear, but uh, now I will open the floor for question and answers, as you mentioned, and uh, uh, Mrs. Nsego is here also to, to help you with that. Um, I, I'm trying to go through this, to the chat to see if there are some questions. I think some of them you already answered. For instance, the first question I saw regarded the temperature of the, of the oven for the drying um, of samples. And I think you already, uh, yeah, they asked yeah, what temperature in terms of degrees is needed for soil drying, but I think you already answered this one. Maybe you can go through it again, just to stress the point. Okay, yeah. I've mentioned already, for instance, that if you don't have a big uh, drying facility and you need to use uh, an oven, uh, 35 degrees centigrade, plus or minus five degrees, it's okay. But the place, the oven must be well ventilated so that the moisture is able to escape. Thank you. Okay, thanks. The next one, I don't know if you or Lete would like to answer, is about, um, is from Egija Stefina, is about uh, what, uh, what kind of grinders could you recommend for sample grinding in if meta analysis are not the aim of subject? Sorry, I didn't get that question. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Uh, did you, yeah. Hello, everyone. Uh, am I audible? Yes. yes. We can yeah. Hear you. Uh, okay. Yeah. I was also looking at at the questions in the in the chat. Yes, I'm looking at the grinding. Uh, what kind of grinders can you recommend for samples grinding if metal analysis are not the aim of subject? Um, I think when we looked at the grind, you were saying to avoid contamination, whether you are going to be looking at the metals or you're not going to be looking at the metals, I think we have to follow the standard procedure of preparing the sample. In case, since we prepare samples and then we keep them, once stored, you might find that you need to do the test for the metals. So the recommended and the standard 
procedure is to use the pistol and the mortar or to use the stainless steel grinders so that you avoid contamination of, of the samples. I think that's what the standard is saying there, that we should use the pistol and the mortar and shouldn't be a metal. Even if you are not going to do the metal analysis, I think the best will be to follow the standard procedure in case once the samples are stored, you find that you need to do uh, that the metal analysis. I think that one, I think I have answered the question. Um, someone was saying, I suspect that if I cash, it will break the small stones. How do I avoid? Um, I think when we do the analysis, Joseph, would you like to help on that one? Okay, yeah. I've mentioned already, like for instance, uh, for relatively loose soils, you can use a rolling pin. You are not supposed mm -hmm. to crush them as if you are using a hammer to really crush the soil samples because the main idea is to disaggregate the soil. So mm -hmm. we, don't want to, we don't want to crush the stones uh, because then they give you false uh, impression on the, especially in the particle size distribution. So you can first of all crush with a rolling pin uh, to make it easier. And then if you are using a pestle and mortar, you don't use all your force. To, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, so you just you use a to force to just disaggregate the samples. That's very important. Then uh, just to add a word on the issue of the, of the grinding. Uh, while we talk about pestle and mortar, it's possible to use agate mortar in particular because that one will not uh, cause, cause contamination. So if you use a stainless steel grinder if you are using a grinding mill, or you use agate, pestle, and mortar, uh, that way you don't uh, lead to cross-contamination. I hope that uh, that mm -hmm. uh, adequately answers your questions. Sorry, I think and, and this part. is yeah. yeah. Oh, sorry. And th this is also covered in the in the SOP on page six. Yeah. I, I think it's it's clearly uh, stating what we should do. Yeah, indeed, let me put in the chat the link to the SOP so participants can easily download the document and can go through it. And I would will, I will like, if you agree, to give the floor to Shulamit uh, Nusboim. I see he has the, he or she, know, uh, has the hands up. Shulamit, do you yes. have a question? Yes, yes, I'm here. Uh, what please. did you ask? Can you please repeat? Sorry? What did you ask me? I see you have the hands up. Do you want to raise a question to the speakers? Ah, yes, I wanted, first of all, thank you for the answer for the stones because when I'm grinding the, the soil, I, I, would, I do not want to mix the soil with the stones. So uh, you say that they have to take it out or something, is what I understand. Yeah, that's correct, yeah. Okay, and another question, if I'm going to, to analyze for pesticides, what uh, special uh, tools do I have to avoid or to use in order to uh, make it uh, to avoid contamination or to avoid the adorb to the tools I'm using? Now, uh, pesticides analysis is a, a very specialized analysis. That's not part of the routine analysis that goes on in the lab and requires very special procedures because you don't want additional contamination or you don't want also to lose the pesticides that are already in the soil. Uh, for instance, uh, even the drying procedure, if the temperature is too high, some of the pesticides will not even volatilize. So there, there are special standard procedure, uh, standard operating procedure for preparing soils for pesticide analysis. And uh, some of the precautions you need to uh, take actually center on the uh, trying to make sure that you don't lose the pesticide that's already in the soil or even add any additional one to it. Some, like I mentioned, some of those pesticides are already volatile materials. So you don't want high temperature. Uh, and you need you need a uh, fine enough fraction in order to get a good surface area for the extraction. If it's not fine enough, you will not be able to extract uh, uh, all the material. But that's a real uh, tricky one because uh, when you are trying to make it fine, the tendency is that you may generate some heat and lose some samples. But uh, this the standard operating procedure that has been put on the web, uh, FAO website now did not take into consideration for pesticides. So for pesticide analysis, it would be good to consult our special SOPs that are prepared for pesticide analysis extraction. Thank you. 
Thank you. Thanks. Thanks for addressing the question. Thanks, Philomit, for raising it. I invite all other participants to um, raise your question because I think this is a good opportunity. You have two experts here just uh, for you, open to answer your, your questions. I see there is another question in the chat from Jose Ramon Cuesta. Uh, I don't know if Lesego or Josef, you, who wants to reply to this, is about uh, the slide about color chart. So the question is, um, Jose, so in one of the slides, a color chart to compare the color with the samples. Are they available? Oh, whether the color charts are available? Yeah, I think it refers to that. I don't know if Jose wants to take the floor or I think the question is clear. Oh, well, of course, they are, they are available, they are for sale. <laughs> they are commercially available. You can purchase the Moncel color chart from uh, different organizations. We cannot begin to advertise those organizations now. But yeah, I think, I think it was one, yeah. Yeah, soil monster charts are readily available uh, for purchase. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Joseph. Um, any remarks? Uh, really, I think I really invite uh, participants also to share your, um, I mean, your experience in these procedures because you may have. Uh, you may ask, adopt different steps or mo slight modification process to, to this method. So if you want to share your experience or if, uh, if you use any different methodology, please share it also with us because it's also a way to, to maybe improve the SOP we already harmonize. Or if you have any concerns or any um, challenges or any issues in preparing your soil samples before soil analysis, please let us know. Uh, we are uh, here to support. I'd like to reiterate one of the points that uh, Lesogo made on the issue of uh, uh, sample preparation. Oftentimes, especially for, some, for laboratories that have uh, soil archives, uh, it's, it's, it's better to err on the side of caution by making sure that you do very thorough sample preparation, uh, not minding whether you are doing metal analysis or not. Now, for those who are just doing routine soil analysis for agronomic purposes, for advisory purposes, where the samples are returned to the uh, clients, uh, if they didn't request for metal analysis, okay, maybe you can use a simpler tools to use to do the sample preparation. But uh, as a matter of principle of the course, it's better to always prepare for the analysis as if all the parameters are going to be analyzed. That way, in case you need to go back to do the analysis, you will not say, oh, we can't use this sample because the process of going back to collect another sample is very cumbersome. It's better if the sample is already ready for all types of analysis than for you to go back now to resample when you need to do analysis that wasn't initially uh, requested. Thank you. Uh, many thanks. Mm. I don't know if you, want, you have any other remarks, so let's wait if someone has more questions. Let me just remind everyone that the same webinar of today will be presented tomorrow as well in French, uh, thanks to colleagues from Djibouti and Niger. Uh, so um, if some of you comes from a French-speaking country or you feel more comfortable to attend the meeting in French, um please remember that tomorrow the same time so 10 a.m uh gmt plus one will be the webinar on sample preparation in french so s'il y a des participants qui préfèrent suivre la session en français je vous invite à vous connecter à la session de demain qui se tenait en français et well um there's another question yeah there are two other questions there yeah. i don't know if you also follow Tego who wants to go to it please Let's go. Okay, let me tell yeah. you. The, the question I, I is: How many hours of soil? Uh, how many hours of soil sample to dry oven temperature at thirty-five? Okay, I think they're asking how long should you dry the sample if you are drying at thirty-five degrees centigrade. Mm. You will agree with me that the period of drying depends a lot on the type of sample. If it's mm. sandy, it's uh, loamy or clay sample. The more clay you have, the longer it will take to dry. But on the average, uh, usually, if you are drying in the oven, uh, overnight drying 
or a whole day of drying, 24 hours of drying should do. But when you examine and you see that the sample is still wet, especially for clay samples, you can extend the time of drying. Assuming that you have good enough drafts of air to be taken out the moisture from your dryer. Then there's a second question there. Uh, considering the importance of the topic under discussion, I think the scope of this webinar should have expanded to involve soil sampling in the field. Oh, well, yeah. We have, I think that we have other SOPs on soil sampling also. This is mainly directed at the SOP on soil sample preparation. Mm. Hopefully, uh, another seminar will handle soil sampling. Mm. I think, I think the, also we are trying to emphasize on the fact that we are looking at the practice in the lab because the, we, there are instances where we have, we just receive samples from customers. We don't go to the field to go and sample. But at the same time, we do give guidance to the customer to say, when you bring the sample to the lab, this is the requirement uh, for us to give you better results. We would like you to go and sample, depending on what the sample is going to be used for, we would like you to sample this way, if this is what you need us to help you with in the sample. And today's lesson is just focusing on what we do in the lab, not what is actually being done at the field. But the guidance for the field part, I think is there. It will be discussed on uh, at its time. I was going to also try on emphasize on the cleanliness of equipment, because when we do soil preparation, like Joseph was saying, uh, they, sell, they can easily be contamination when we don't really take heed of the fact that we really have to be, the, very, the equipment has to be cleaned thoroughly before you put in another sample. So that the cleanliness, and as we take in new stuff and train them, it's very critical to mentor them on the sample preparation because like Joseph was saying, this is the very critical stage. We lose at this stage, the whole process is not necessary to be carried out. I think we need to emphasize those ones, cleanliness on preparation of the samples and the other things that we have just been looking at. Uh, somebody is saying, I read that the air drying can be done at 50 degrees for 24 hours, uh, which parameters would be necessarily affect, negatively affected by this temperature? Oh, Joseph being the teacher, I think you can answer this one. <laughs> you know, especially in uh, uh, two to one clay mineral soils, if you dry at higher temperature, you may begin to occlude your, uh, your K, you can be trapped inside your lettuces. So uh, the standard operating procedure says 35 plus or minus 40. Uh, for if, when they are recommending 50 degrees centigrade for 24 hours, it will depend on what type of analysis you are actually going to carry out. But uh, uh, yes, there are a few parameters that are affected by high temperature. Somebody mentioned already, for instance, if you want to prepare soil samples for pesticide analysis, by the time you are going to 50 degrees centigrade, you are losing some of your pesticides. Then those who are also involved in environmental analysis, we have some of the environmental, uh, some of the uh, elements that are a bit more volatile that are affected by high temperature, even though those are uh, in very small concentrations, uh, some heavy metals. Uh, so the higher the temperature, the more you lose those volatile metals. And Lastly, uh, it's good to stick to the standard operating procedure to make your results comparable to what other people are doing in other parts of the world. I hope that answers your question. Okay, thank you. Good. Uh, is there someone who wants to take the floor? Again, you're all welcome to, um, to unmute and raise your question directly to Joseph on or let's say go. Uh, again, let me, um, maybe let me uh, show you in the meantime while we're waiting for new questions, uh, where 
the file is available to download. So let me share my screen. Uh, as you can see, this is the Gluton website. I hope. Wait, let me open that there. Just a second. I hope you can see my screen. This is the Glutalan website. I hope you are all familiar with it. Uh, if no, well, you can just Google Global Soil Laboratory Network or Glutalan or whatever. Uh, if you go here on soil analysis on the left menu, you will uh, be directed to this web page. If you click on standard operating procedures, you will find all the SOPs that Glutalan have managed so far organizing parameters. For instance, for soil chemical parameters, you just click on the on the element you are in on the parameters you are interested in, uh, and you will find SOPs. More SOPs will be uploaded very soon. We are currently finalizing them. For instance, if you click on carbon, you will find the SOPs we are monitoring so far in carbon. Even some videos are here available. So for instance, there is here a training video on work claim back both titration and colorimetric methods. So just click here and you will see also a video for the implementation of the procedures. Uh, you can select the subtitles in different languages here. And you can, for instance, follow it in French, Spanish, Arabic, and so on. Uh, or you can download the uh, file here. Well, if we go back here to the SOP uh, webpage, you will find uh, a, an item called uh, sample preparation. Just a second, it is uploading. Yeah, here on site characterization sampling and sample pretreatment, you will find here. 1.3 sam soil sample pretreatment, and you can find here the SOP for handling and, and preparation of soil sample for chemical and physical analysis. Just click here, and you will find this document that is the one presented today. So you can download it for free, just go through it as you want. So this is where the file is available, and then you and basically is the content that was presented today. So you find all the all the steps for sample preparation. Uh, let me also show you on this web page. If you click here on capacity development, you will find all the information regarding glutenum webinars. So organized by category. So we have wet chemistry, dry chemistry, and health and safety. A new section on quality assurance and quality control will be uh, displayed very soon, because as I mentioned, there will be a training in a week. And if you click on wet chemistry, you find all the, all the um, webinars implemented so far on this topic. So you see we have phosphorus, organic carbon measurement. Uh, yeah, and this is the one of today. So here we will upload soon in this, in, this, in this part here, we will upload soon the presentation and the video recording of today's session. While this is the link to register to, tom to the tomorrow sessions in French. And it will be still at 10 a.m. Uh, GMT plus one. And also here we will upload the video recording and the presentation in French of tomorrow. Then we will have another, another presentation on soil ethical conductivity on the 14th of December. We we'll find here the, present, the presentation of the, of the guest speakers and the short abstract of the session. And here you can register by clicking at this link. So uh, I highly encourage you to uh, go on our website because all the information are available there and uh, to be updated about all the webinars that Closeland is organizing thanks to the support again of all our trainers. So I, I think there are some more, uh, there's a question on the chat from Vanya Chavez, maybe let me read it. Um, uh, it's about, yeah, field capacity. I mean, it's about soil sampling. Uh, if I got it, Vanya is asking for that. Well, uh, we are, GSP is working on that and uh, we will make uh, if some guidelines on sample collection soon, because you mean, uh, you see, this is a sample, so it's sample collection is something uh, that sometimes is not really affecting soil laboratories. Of course, we have to be sure that samples are, coll are collected well, but uh, most of laboratories uh, are not experts on soil collection because they are experts in soil analysis. So we are organizing, GSP is organizing, is will, I mean, we are, is organizing a working group to work on this and we will be experts from Glosolan, experts from the soil mapping part, uh, experts from different topics. So we will try to uh, work on a document on soil sampling for different uh, purposes. So soil analysis and different type of analysis um, and different soil mapping. And so 
because I think, as Joseph mentioned, where different analysis require different type of sampling and different type of size, size fraction. We know that, for instance, bulk density, we need a certain type of sample that is different from other type of analysis. Maybe, uh, yeah, Joseph, maybe or later you can stress how important it's on sampling, but again, this is a little bit outside this presentation, but we will talk about this in a separate session, maybe. Okay, I'll try to post the link, the direct link to the SOP on uh, some sample preparation on the chat. So those who want to go okay. directly. Um, any more questions? I see there are participants from all over the world. So um, again, if you want to share your knowledge, your experience about this methodology, please feel free to take the floor. Eh? We will we look forward to hear from, from, your, from your experience, from your lab. How do you perform sample preparation? How do you, let's say, pre-treat the samples before uh, analysis? Which kind of instrumentation you use? If you have any doubts or if you are in need of suggestions from Josef or Letego, please take advantage of these two experts because they are here just to answer all your questions and, and like your consideration. So please, I really encourage you to take the floor in case you want uh, to share your, uh, your comments, your, your opinions. I received like a, a question in the private chat asking uh, about the, um, the material for uh, uh, soil um, on where to store the soil. If it's plastic, is more recommended that glass and jar. Like maybe you can clarify this point. Uh, yeah, it depends on how long the storage is going to be. For a lab that has a uh, light throughput for. Uh, uh, advisory purpose for farmers where the samples don't need to be kept for long. Uh, strong plastic bag is okay. Even some uh, thick khaki uh, uh, cloth bag is also possible. Uh, but for longer term storage, it's better if you have uh, some glass bottles or some, uh, uh, if possible, Teflon uh, plastic materials that can withstand uh, the long term storage. Now, some other type of plastic materials are very brittle over the years. So if you use some type of material that is easily brittle and then after four or five years, it begins to fall apart, then you are going to lose your sample. So the length of storage is very important in determining the type of storage material that you are going to use. Of course, glass is the preferable one for very long-term storage uh, for those dry samples. The samples don't change so much in storage uh, for most of the regular soil parameters. Uh, so, of course, you can't store soil samples that are meant for pesticide analysis in plastic containers because the plastic containers will absorb some of the pesticides. So, uh, the purpose of the storage will determine what type of material you are using for the storage, uh, especially the length of storage that you are going to do. But three clear options. Simple uh, poly bags, Ziploc bags for quick throughput samples, some paper bags also for so quick throughput samples. For long term storage, then you better use uh, something like glass or uh, more resistant uh, uh, polypropylene uh, containers if you are not interested in pesticide analysis. I hope that answers your question. So uh, there is um, another question in the chat. From Philippines, you say in their traditional way of grinding, they use wooden mallet to avoid crushing the soil completely during the process. Would it still be okay? 
to do it. Yes, I think I mentioned that during the presentation that you can use rolling pin, even the rolling pin that you normally use for dough, <laughs> uh, or ladies use for baking flour, things like that. Roll mm. it over. Yes, roll it over the samples until the thing is completely blue. So yes, wooden mallets can be used, but even wooden mallets can crush stones, you know, if you use so much force. Just keep at the back of your mind that you are, you are not interested in crushing the stones. You just want to loosen the soil particles. So the wooden mallet is okay if you don't uh, use too much force. You can also use the rolling pin, uh, but whichever one you are using, make sure it is specifically for soil sample preparation. Don't finish using it and go and use it for something else. Okay. The question is well answered, thanks. Uh, another question I received in the private chat is about the, the time, that the, how long the um, samples can be stored, uh, even if in glass jars, uh, before the analysis can be performed. I mean, like, is, are we talking about months or years even? Oh, we have samples that are stored in some cell repositories for 50 years plus now. So that's why I said it depends on the purpose for which the storage, if you, uh, what is it now in the UK? Uh, Rotamsted uh, Station, they have samples from long-term experiments that have been stored. So it depends on uh, the purpose for which you want to store it. Uh, in my lab, for instance, we store samples for uh, our regular clients for a maximum period of two months. After that time, if we don't hear anything from you, we are going to dispose of those samples. But our research samples are different because uh, some of our research samples are from long-term experiments and those ones need to be stored for a much longer period. We have samples that have been stored for over 20 years. So, so it depends on the purpose for which you want to uh, store it. But in any of those cases, just make sure you use the appropriate storage materials and in the appropriate storage environment. For soil samples, uh, well ventilated, or properly air conditioned environment is, is enough already. Soils are rugged materials, they don't deteriorate so uh, much in storage. Oh, thanks for the nice answer. Um, let's see if there are any more comments or questions from the chat, or if someone feels like to take the floor. I don't know if they say go yours if you would like to share any other like even experience you had in the in your lab so far, especially regarding the, the methodology or the equipment you used to uh, use adopt in the past years. Uh, maybe you used to have different procedures rather than the one you're using now, or if you always feel comfortable with this, or if you change slightly the methodology. Thank you, uh, Filippo. In fact, I was, I was going to add on what Joseph said first about the storages and the, the containers. I was going to say that even though we'll be using glass bottles, we have to be sure that we the list that we use, if it's going to be for, for farming purposes, we have to make sure that the list that we use are not the metal, metal lids. Because after some time, the little moisture that comes from the soil it, it, the, the leads rust. And when you rerun the samples, you'll be saying you have a lot of iron in the soil while it's from the leads that rusted. And if you are going to be using, throwing away the samples and re reusing the containers that you use for storing, you have to make sure that they are in a good state to keep the samples for long. And like you are saying, when you have, when we are using, uh, doing the storages for farming purposes, like for example, in our case, we say we can keep the samples for three years, uh, looking at the fact that we give farmers guidance on what fertilizer to use at what quantities and for what period. They are doing the dry land farming, which is rain dependent. So over the three years, we can still use the same samples to, see, to guide them on what to apply to the field. So when it comes to the, um, what was I going to say? So I was looking at something here. Um, the use of the rolling pins, uh, the grinding, I was going to 
talk about the grinding because we are talking about what about if you crush the stone and all that. We know that the soil is from the mother stone. And uh, the reason why we just use trolling pins, we are gentle with the soil is because we are interested with in the active active particles of the soil. The stone is, is when we do the extractions, mostly it's, it's hard, you can't extract much from it. And when you look at the nutrients, we are saying uh, uh, there has to be a site for them to, to cling to the soil. And when it's a hard stone, normally the, the sites are not active. So you can't have much activity on the stone. So when, once you have gently ground or rolled a pin, you just sieve and throw away the stones. We don't need them. We are interested on the, on the, on the soil part, the one that can be, can be used by the plant to extract something from it in the case of, of the farming. Uh, that's the three year storage and it can be shorter depending uh, on like Joseph was saying on the need of the customer. If it's a commercial farmer, somebody who is in the business because they will be rotating the, 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 their plants on the field more frequent and maybe using the field the whole year. So the testing will be more frequent. So we don't keep the samples. They come bring the samples, you test, you throw them away. Then they bring a new sample because they are going to plant something new from what they had planted. So every time you advise on, depending on what they are going to be using the results for. Uh, as for the type of, of equipment that we have been using, we have been using the drying ovens, we have been using the, 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 the milling, the mechanical millers for preparation of our samples. And we have been saved storing in plastic containers for a short period, but most of the time we use bottles, the, plus, the, the glass bottles for storage. Um, what other experience can I share? Uh, do you see any other question that we can address? Well, just uh, a, a little suggestion on moving forward. Uh, yeah things that can help in uh, traceability of your samples and avoiding uh, mm -hmm. sample mix-ups is mm. if you uh, do uh, barcode labeling or QR labeling. Mm. That's, that's very helpful because even if the sample drops off somewhere, once you see it with your barcode reader, you can easily identify uh, where the sample is coming from and things like that. So it's a good idea. And now our days, uh, even our cell phones, can read uh, barcodes. So it's, it's easy, it's, it's an easy technology to add, but it goes a long way helping to maintain sample integrity in the lab. So uh, that's just a suggestion. And, and, and when you talked about the referencing, it's, it's very important because mostly when the customers, like you were saying in the presentation, when the customers bring in the samples, they have their own reference. The lab is going to attach their own reference. And we have to make sure that both references are used in the sample. Because normally when we report, we give the customer, in most cases, you will find that the customer gets the report excluding their reference. But it's very important to make sure that even in the report, you have your reference as the lab and the customer's reference. Because this customer reference helps the customer to identify the area of sampling, where they got the sample. So it's very, very critical that when we, uh, uh, we, we, we record, whether manually or electronically, we keep both references uh, for, for using them at a later stage or for aligning them with the test results that we get. Thank you, Filippo. Thanks to you. Thanks to you, actually. Uh, let me see if there is any more remark. And indeed, thanks for sharing your experience. Thank you.
it doesn't look like we have any more comments. Do you see anything in the chat? No, there's not a point in the chat. Well, in this case, I think we can, uh, you, you got a really nice overview of the whole methodology. Uh, I want to thank you once again um, uh, for the nice presentation and uh, availability to, um, to give this training. And uh, let me, um, so thank you once again, because I think really this is the essence of the, of the network, no? When colleagues meet, and they are ready to share their knowledge, give their time and to and your uh, commitment to to share their knowledge to improve the capacity of the peers of the other colleagues in the world. So not only in their labs, not only in the region or country, but all over the world. We have colleagues here from all over the world for different regions. So I think many of them benefits from your knowledge, uh, Josef and Letego. So I think this is all really important because again this procedure is a basic step that has to be done very well before the analysis otherwise the, um, the data may be not reliable so thanks again for remarking the importance of this procedure thanks a lot for your time uh, let me also remind that tomorrow uh, we have the same meeting in French so if someone feels to participate tomorrow more than welcome I see there's another question from the chat maybe if we can answer this before closing is from Patrice Dongo is which quantity of sample is required after sample treatment? Can you go to it, please? Okay, which quantity of sample is required after sample treatment? You are talking of uh, at the end of preparation, what quantity of sample should you now take to the lab? Uh, well, it depends on the analysis, but basically you need about 200 grams of soil samples, especially if you are going to do a particle size analysis where you need already 50 grams for or thereabouts for the particle size analysis by hydrometer method. The reason you need to take enough samples is because in case you need to repeat or rerun some samples, you still have enough samples left behind. So I recommend minimum quantity that you should uh, prepare for the analysis should be 200 grams. Yes, indeed, like, let me also remark that in glossal NSOPs, you're trying to mention all the samples Amount, uh, quantity is needed for each parameters. So we know that some require less amount like uh, two grams and some other, as you mentioned, even 200 grams. And let me, I think we can also stress the importance of these procedures to prepare samples for reference material, for instance, because part of the, part of the procedures is maybe similar in sample preparation and to prepare samples for internal quality control. So I mean, this is also why this, this procedure is very important because really, uh, we have to be sure that this sample pretreatment is really done in, a, in the correct way. So thanks again. Let me just see if there is any more colleague who wants to share the, their, their, um, their feeling, the, the comments, or they have any question. All right, or like in the, um, can we get regular update training? Uh, uh, this, this question from Tiagar Rajan. Can we get regular update training? You mean about this topic or, or other topics? Because we are organizing different, top, different trainings on different topics, as I mentioned. So um, today is about sample preparation. Then next week, there will be an, a training on electrical so on determination or soil electrical conductivity. So I invite you to join that one. But if you visit the Glossona webpage on Capacity development, uh, you can um, you can uh, be updated about all the training session we're organizing. So let me put the link in the chat and you can follow, you can register to all trainings there. Yeah, so in this webpage, you will find all trainings information, all the information about the trainings we will organize. Um, and both on dry chemistry, so soil spectroscopy and wet chemistry, and also on quality assurance and quality control and health and safety. Uh, even if you miss uh, this, this, the, the trainings that we have been held so far in the last weeks, if you go on this webpage, I put the link in the chat, you are, you are able to see the video recordings and download the presentations that were used. So you can still follow the kind of 
uh, follow the, the training once again. Just you can watch the video once again, and you can um, yeah you can um, go to the training once again if you if you miss it. Jose Mauro Mercurio asked about uh, soil salinity, like which parameter you recommend to analyze soil sample. I think this is, uh, in this regard, I really uh, recommend you to follow next week training about soil electrical conductivity. But I don't know if uh, Joseph and Lesego will like to add any more parameters. So, you know, we have two SOPs already harmonized on saturated paste extract and soil electrical conductivity. Because they are asking about uh, soil salinity, how to, uh, which parameters to target. I don't know if Joseph or Lesego, you want to add something on that. Uh, what do you, Lamita, do you recommend in analyzing saline soils? Oh, parameters. Well, I think, like you already recommended, it would be good if the person can attend the seminar on uh, saline soils. But usually, once we are, once we are uh, dealing with saline soils, we're interested in the salt concentration. So, sodium, mm -hmm. calcium, magnesium. Electrical conductivity, pH, mm -hmm. those are uh, normal things that are required for saline soils. Uh, mm -hmm. Even uh, even the water holding capacity. There are several other things that are of interest for saline soils because the type of irrigation you will do there is not the regular type of irrigation. So there are quite a number of parameters that are of interest for people who are dealing with uh, saline soils. And uh, there are even some publications also on the FEO website that uh, you need to uh, access that will give you much further information. But once we are talking about saline salts, it's about salts. So it's a question of how much sodium in particular, and then mm -hmm. but also other cations, calcium and magnesium in particular, uh, and the relative concentration of those ones in the soil uh, relative to the moisture content of the soil. So all those are very, uh, important parameters in addition to the regular soil test that you do for normal soils. I also add to the to the chat the link to register to the webinar that will be dedicated on soil electrical conductivity. It is maybe one of the main parameters to assess soil salinity if I'm correct. Oh, so yeah. Jose and other colleagues, I invite you to register to this webinar that will be held next week on 14 December. Uh, yeah, Garajan is asking uh, if this PPT will be available. Yes. Uh, we're a little bit in delay with the past webinars, but uh, we will upload this with the recordings and the presentation that was uh, given today on the website of Glossolan. And we will try to um, send all of you that who registered to this webinar a certificate of registration. We'll try to do it as soon as possible. We are sorry, we are really late with that, but hopefully in a couple of days, maximum a week, you will receive the, the certificate of participation to this webinar. Um, and regarding soil salinity, I just, just keep in my mind that uh, yesterday was the worst soil day. So let me also <laughs> wish you in, in delay, happy worst soil day, because this day was, this year was totally, um, let's say dedicated to soil salinity, but of course uh, that is one of the main soil threats. But uh, of course, uh, we celebrate World Soil Day also in the lab, as this is our main activity here in Glossoland. So um, I hope you all have a nice World Soil Day. And remember that your role as um, soil laboratories, people who analyze soil, is to provide reliable data. These are the base to, uh, to make then sound decision on sustainable soil management and uh, soil mapping and everything. Like soil really is a, is a basic of, for this and really need uh, reliable, interpretable, and comparable data. So this is why soil laboratories plays an active role in that. And this is also why during the World Soil Day celebration year at FAO headquarters, we present the global assessment of soil laboratories worldwide, because just to stress the importance of soil laboratories are playing in, uh, in soil management, actually. And uh, as we don't have any more questions, I think, in the chat, let me, before closing the... Um, the webinar. Let me show you a video that was produced for the World Soil Day. I don't know if you are, even if in case you didn't attend the, the headquarters celebration in Rome online. Uh, we a video was created about um, 
sustainable soil management of saline soils, very short video uh, from the artistic perspective. So I would like to share with you again, just to close the meeting in a, in a different way. So let me share the screen before we, we close the meeting. Let me try to um, share the video. I hope this is visible. I'll go out to clear my mind Nothing better than a walk In the place where I belong The air feels nice Fresh on my skin But something's not I'll do my magic to the sea This was just uh, just to close the this meeting with the different ways. So I see someone is asking for the video. So you can send it on YouTube. Let me put the link in the chat. Um, so again, happy World Soil Day. Uh, you can uh, celebrate it in your lab, of course, because uh, you deal with soil every day. You are those providing uh, data and knowledge of this soil. So what? And the video show as the magic boots. So the way the, the boots with the eyes can see the soil is basically the work of soil laboratories, no? You can really analyze the soil and provide the nice answers on its characteristics. So uh, this was also to gain some time um, to, to, get, to, to get time to the people to ask more questions, but I don't receive any more questions in the chat. So once again, uh, the link for the presentation will be available soon on the website of Glossodan on the capacity development webpage. Uh, we'll put now the link once again in the chat. After this training, we will upload the presentation and the video recordings online. So uh, I invite you to, to, to consult this webpage. I just put the link. The, the, if you want to rewatch the video recordings or the consult the presentation, download the presentation, while the SOPs for these um, that were presented today, so the standard operating procedures for sample preparation is available uh, to this new link I put. So you can download it for free and, and, and go through it. Uh, I don't know if uh, Joseph and let's say you, will, you feel like comfortable to add your email address in the chat. So people, if they have more questions, they can write to you directly maybe. Okay. 
So if you have any more questions or if you feel like contacting them in the, in the, in the, in the future, you can find the email address of Josef and Lesego in the chat. We are adding them now. So please feel free to contact them if you have any more questions. And yeah, I invite you to register to the upcoming training session of Glossolan. And uh, I thank once again, Josef and Lesego for the nice presentation, for the nice support through the session. I invite you to attend tomorrow's meeting in French if you are from a French speaking country. Um, yeah, well, uh, all the best then. Thanks a lot, Joseph and Lisego. Your, uh, your, um, your support is, was really highly appreciated. Um, and the nice support, I think, really was inspiring for all laboratories who attend from all over the world. So many thanks to you. I don't know if you want to have any closing remarks. Thank you very much, Filippo. And okay. thanks to, ev to everyone who attended and the contribution that um, everybody made. Uh, as I have said in the message, I think it was a good, for everybody, it was a learning process. Even if you are the facilitator, you are still learning from the group. This was wonderful to be in today. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you all. Also, it's been a privilege to share knowledge with us. Uh, we look forward to seeing you at the other presentations. Thank you, Filippo, for uh, your good organization. Thanks. Thanks to you. Thanks to you guys for your support. Really, without your like, the support of these experts, we, these webinars cannot be implemented. So I really also take the advantage of to um, take the opportunity to encourage uh, all participants who feel like to serve as trainers, if you want to share your knowledge, so please contact us. So you, we may um, organize uh, a training sessions on other topics according to your area of expertise. So if you feel like serving as trainers, please uh, contact me or Lucrezia or your regional chair, and we can organize together different webinars. So thanks you once again. This was really important also because this topic, so um, sample pretreatment was highlighted and identified as a main need uh, of, for training subject from different regions uh, during the regional meeting. So I think this was very important to implement this training today. Uh, again, this was really the, the basic step in soil analysis because regarding pretreatment, so very important step. Again, we will try to disseminate the, the certificate of attendance in the upcoming days. So basically by next week, I hope you will receive it. Thanks you for your for participating. Thanks everyone. And I wish you uh, a, a good rest of the day or evening, depending where you are. Um, hope to see you soon. Thanks again. Thank you. Bye. Bye.